to flick the switch commemorating his grandfather's groundbreaking experiment. On the 2nd of October 1925, John Logie Baird successfully transmitted and received the world's first television images. Hey, look at that, there he is. That's really good. After this triumph, Baird went on to achieve a number of other world firsts. The first broadcast between London and Glasgow and the first transatlantic broadcast to New York. Well, there you go. Logie Baird, smarter than the average Baird, of course. <laughs> You've been but, waiting uh, for that, Do you know, you? I tell you, it, all, it amazes me every time I see that. I still can't work out how on earth television works, but uh, here we all are, obviously, on television. Yes, strangely. Yes. Um, and tell me about, you play the aunt in I this, do. don't you, of this young girl who witnesses a murder, the silence. Um, what was it like playing her? Uh, well, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was hugely challenging. And we had a terrific director called Dervla Walsh, who is really extraordinary. But the most exciting thing was actually watching this pretty much unknown actress, Genevieve Barr, mm -hmm. carry the whole show. And it's very much through her eyes and, incidentally, through her ears. But it's, it's just extraordinary to watch her. I think she's fantastic. Yeah. She's a, a fantastic a there, actress. Yeah. And she, she herself is she's severely deaf, isn't she? Yeah, too? she is. I mean, you know, for me, she's an actress first yeah. who happens to be deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, but... She's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's have a little look at a clip of mm. your character, Maggie, who comes face to face with one of the bad guys, because there's quite a few in it. There are, um, yeah. But this is, this is a moment from tonight's programme. Hooray! Yes. <laughs> Here it comes. Uh, I was told I could come here and get a brief for Jane Shilliday. Oh, well, they're, uh, they're very good here. You recommend them? Well, yeah, yeah. It's just I've heard you're very good. Oh. Uh, do you want me to organise this? Oh, didn't you? Well, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 you can, you can pay me later. Sorry, I don't think I introduced myself. Um, Pete McKinnon. People call me Mac. I've got you on that now. He is a spooky, spooky character, isn't he? Well, but, there's um, a lot at stake. Yeah, but, I mean, I have to say, you are an incredibly convincing mum of these teenagers that you have Thank there. Thank you, you very and you, much. Obviously, yeah, you have children yourself. I do, yes. And, and does, it, does it worry you, obviously, looking at the children that you're acting with, those teenagers, that your kids are going to kind of... I'm absolutely terrified. I'm oh, yeah, sure really. I've messed them up, and psychologically, yeah. they're warped already. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 w I would hope that in the future that we'll have a good enough relationship where they can come and talk to me about anything and, and yeah. I won't embarrass them but of course we all oh, you must I embarrass will. them I've all, you know I embarrass <laughs> them constantly um, yeah it, it was it just came very naturally but we were it was it's a beautifully written script mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the relationships were, were very well rehearsed beforehand mm -hmm. and everyone gives so much of themselves to it and I, and I also think it was beautifully cast yeah um, and that sort of is on the screen you can really feel that on the screen Mm. Tell us as well, because you've been doing another project, who do you think you are? What yeah. was that like when they asked you to do it? Were you scared? Were you mm. worried by what you'd find? No, no, because I'm so stupid. I never think that they're <laughs> going to find anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. What a great experience. I thought, great, I'll be able to show the kids. They'll be, you know. But and, everybody wants and then I was utterly, And I was, well, exactly. <laughs> I, I was utterly traumatised. And, uh, and then they said, but you're really enjoying yourself, aren't you? Yeah. And you get so close to them, you don't mm. want to say, actually, I'd like to slip my wrists today mm. uh, no, but you know I, I, it was great and yeah, I mean you discovered quite quite some yeah, very some interesting very, characters didn't you yeah very much so I mean um, I never knew my my grandfather on my mother's side mm. and I never knew anything about my great-grandfather on my father's side so I don't and, know how much I can say famous and really interesting Michael Michael Collins because you are related to him as well, very much you? so he's yeah. my great-granduncle and I'm hugely proud of that uh, connection do you think you have are you similar to him uh, I, I got my God, if I could have been, or if, if I yes. could be, yes, I would love to. But he's be. famous in Irish history, isn't he? Yeah, well, he's a tremendous political leader, and he's an mm. extraordinarily intelligent man. So if I've got even a soup song of that, I'd be very pleased. And your episode is on August twenty second. The second, I yeah. think. Second, August second, second, sorry, second. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Well, we'll look out for that. Thank you. No. For many men, that retirement can be a golden age when they can relax and enjoy the fruits of their working life. For others, however, it can mean living life alone, away from the friends that they built up in the workplace. Yeah, but Dom's met a group of retired men in Cheshire who have discovered a life-changing way uh, to combat their loneliness. It is a spot of woodwork and a natter in the local shed. Great. 
Harry Littler was married for 56 years, but his wife Amy died eight years ago, and since then, he's lived alone. When I was on my own, my wife died, they got very depressed. And I, I wouldn't do anything or go anywhere. We were so much a pair of uh, partners. Her life was my life and my life was her life. And I missed her a great deal, I still do. Adjusting to life alone hasn't been easy, but Harry, who's almost 92, refuses to shut himself away. And when Harry goes out, this is where he's heading. Men in sheds, a haven for older men. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Harry. Men come here to build things, work side by side, discuss their problems, or simply catch up over a nice cup of tea. Sounds simple enough, but for many, it's a real lifeline. What a lot of people don't realise is a third of men over 65 years old will start to get lonely. And as they get older, that will just increase, which is why something like this, men in sheds, is absolutely perfect for them. This is the first scheme of its kind in the UK. It's been so successful, age-concerned Cheshire is opening three more in the next year. Now, when the one show said me come and interview some guys working in sheds, I was rather thinking it was going to be a six by four construction, clinker built, softwood, the sort of thing you buy in a DIY store. Not some factory unit like this with microwaves, kettles, toilets, and a lot of guys who look very happy indeed. Morning, young man. Malcolm Bird is the man in charge. Everybody seems so content round here. Yeah, we're a happy bunch. I've noticed. What do you put that down to? Uh, I think it's because we're so relaxed. You yeah. don't have to come in and clock on, you don't clock out. If you want to stop and have a cup of tea, anytime, all the time, that's fine. Give me an idea what you guys chat about. Oh, uh, football. Yeah. Uh, what was on the telly last night? Have you seen Harry's scooter done it go fast? I might have one of them when I retire. <laughs> OK, so it's all sort of fairly harmless chatting. Yeah, yeah. And if you're stuck for conversation, there's always practical things to discuss. Have you put nails in there? In that? Yeah. And for some, it's a kind of therapy. If I didn't have men in sheds, it would mean going back to a sort of life that I had before, which was a very, very lonely one. In that project folded now, I would be very, very unhappy. This whole thing started with just four members. Now, there are at least ten men coming every day. Bob, a recovering alcoholic, is one of them. Drinking at home, you tend to gradually lose contact with all the friends, and so the isolation was pretty bad. Uh, but when I started to go to the shed, it was another social scene to be part of, and I grabbed it by the horns. Another opportunity Bob's grabbing is the chance to build his skills and his confidence, which he's hoping will help in his search for a job. Then you've got a guide then. Yeah. The men I've spoken to are clear about what Men in Sheds has done for them, but let's not forget, it's also a place where men can just simply be men. What I notice looking around is, there seems to be a lot of testosterone here and no pheromones. No women. No women. No. Why not? Blokes relate differently when they're on their own yeah. to when they have a woman in here. If we bring a woman in here, yeah. the whole atmosphere changes. Does it? So have you ever can... had any women out there campaigning you know, with placards and that saying, Oi, oi, we want to be in the Men in Sheds Club? To be honest, most of them say, can you take my husband in no. there and get him out my way? <laughs> but it's a good job, really, because this lot are happy as they are. Just men together in a shed. Now, guys, I've got to ask you, to all the ladies out there who might be watching this and want to join your club, have you got a message for them? Yeah, go You're not coming in! <laughs> Brilliant stuff. I tell you, you should have heard the conversation going on during that film between these two, <laughs> their husbands and their sheds. Yes. Yeah. Her gorgeous husband, Rupert Penry Jones. There we are. Enough yeah. about him. Yes. Sheds can solve every <laughs> yes. problem. Now then, there was more frustration today at Fort BP who have delayed the testing of a new cap aimed at stopping the gallons of oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. The disaster means that energy companies are now, more than ever, looking at green sources of power such as offshore wind farms. Yeah, but even these have the potential to disturb our wildlife. Mike Dilger has taken to the skies with one of the men who is making sure that wind power doesn't blow our native seabirds away. 
The seas around our coastline are home to some of the biggest and best seabird populations in the world. And they're tough old birds, living on rough seas and gliding effortlessly on strong winds that would buffet us senseless. But they're not the only ones facing our weather. Increasingly, energy companies are wanting to put more wind turbines out at sea to cash in on our climate. But as that's also where the birds live and feed, that could cause problems. So conservation groups have been doing a spot of blue sky thinking. They've teamed up with energy companies to survey the seabirds and find locations where there's minimal bird activity. Seabirds tend to congregate around good feeding sites and nesting grounds. If a wind farm was built at one of these hotspots, it could devastate that population. So the surveyors are looking for hotspots and clear spots. Mike Shackshaft is an ornithologist from the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust Consultancy and he's been taking to the air. We use aeroplanes because it gives us an opportunity to cover a large area in a short space of time so we can get a good snapshot in one day. It also allows us to get into areas of shallow water which boats and people from land might not be able to see. Um, so it just gives us a really good opportunity to get in there. Bearing in mind how fast planes fly, you've got to be really sharp in your identification, haven't you? Yeah, we only have about maybe five seconds to uh, identify these birds, so we have to be, get onto them pretty quick. We have to identify them, count how many they are, and also try and work out how far away from the plane they are. At that speed, this is going to be ultimate bird watching, but I'm up for the challenge. Here we go, all systems go, ready for the takeoff. Let's go birding. The average survey covers 1,200 square kilometres a day. We're heading to the north coast of Wales. I'm used to driving along the A55 on the way to Anglesey, but I've never had this view before. It's a fabulous bird's eye view. Most seabirds tend to fly pretty close to the sea, soaring on the updraft from the waves and looking for fish. Trouble is, these planes don't go slower than 100 miles an hour or lower than 75 metres or 250 feet. So this really is speed twitching, but Mike is right on it. Hawk one sat A, then uh, herring gull one flying in B. Uh, Kitty wake one flying in A, then gannet one flying in A. With less than five seconds to glimpse a bird, there's no time to write anything down, so it all goes on a tape recorder. Former one flying in A, then Hawk one flying in B. You're using, obviously, the bird name and A, B, C and D. What does that mean? Um, whilst we're recording our birds, we try to record how far away from the plane they are so we can map them more accurately. And we put them into four distinct uh, sort of distance bands. A is the area right beneath the plane. B is about 300 metres away. C is around 400 metres. And D is up to a massive one kilometre. Yet Mike can still identify them. Herring gull, one flying an A. Gannet, got a gannet. Gannet flying away in A. Gannets are big travellers, flying up to 200 miles from one hotspot to another in search of fish. So part of the survey is to identify these routes and add them to the vital list of no-go areas for turbines. Really rich area for seabirds around the Orm. Fantastic. Not the place for turbines. Oh, one greater blackback flying bee. I'm getting the hang of this now. When the ornithologists find a clear spot, they continue to check it just to be sure it's safe. And so far, five wind farms have been put up in